Thank you so much, Romana. And thank you, everybody, for coming out to the event this evening to hear uh, two wonderful speakers and two of my own personal heroes in the field of Ukrainian culture and uh, literature, Lenslash uh, and Sashadolu. Um, for our discussion of language in the time of war, um, we have to um, my left, Elena Stiarshina, who is a writer and public intellectual and historian from Donetsk. She is a, a researcher of the Institute of Ukrainian History and the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences, and before 2014 she was a professor of history at Donetsk University. Uh, she is also a writer of fiction, as well as being a historian. Her works include Cecil the Lion Had to Die, which is forthcoming with Harvard University Press, Roska, In God's Language, um, and her history works include The Taste of the Soviet, Food and Eating in the Art of Life and the Art of Cinema, 1960s and 1980s, Zero Point Ukraine, Four Essays in World War II, which has been translated and available through the Ibn Press, and also The Stigma of Occupation, Soviet Women and Their Self Image in the 1940s. Uh, her book, Ukraine War of Love, a Donetsk Diary, a non fiction book about the experience of the war, is also forthcoming with Harvard Ukraine University Press. And we're also joined by Sasha Dobrik, who is a writer, a literary scholar, and curator from Zaporizhia, uh, and also uh, a lecturer in Ukrainian studies at UCL uh, She is also special projects coordinator for the Ukrainian Institute of London, and her writings have appeared in The Guardian, The LA Review of Books, CNN, Open Democracy, and many others. And as well as her work on Ukraine, she is also a specialist on fin de siècle culture, and, uh, and specifically the work of Aubrey Beardsley. Um, so our discussion will be about uh, language and its various, various different questions related to language and the war in Ukraine. Um, language being a very, very important question in this context, but also a question which is very much misunderstood, very much misrepresented, and often manipulated. Um, it's been one of the factors that's been used in Russian propaganda justifying its aggression against Ukraine not only over the last uh, year or so since February last year but also for the last uh, nine years. The myths about the language situ situation in Ukraine are stubborn. Um, so myths such as Ukraine being a country divided by language where one part, of the line, one part of the country speaks Ukrainian, the other part, part speaks Russian, and the people's political views and identities are different you know, according to that, uh, differ according to that linguistic split. Uh, the idea that Russian speakers in Ukraine experience persecution and oppression, um, these are things which are still have a certain currency in the West, even after all the same, even, even after the, the last year, um, things that we're still, those of us who work in Ukraine, um, are still trying to um, debunk. So I hope we can do a bit of that debunking this evening. Um, because you know, people who are from Ukraine, people who go to Ukraine and, and, and experience life in Ukraine, know that the language situation is much more complex, it's much more nuanced, it's much more interesting, it's much more messy than these black and white ideas of division would suggest. Um, it has historically been a country, a multilingual country, it's still a country where multiple languages function within society. It's a place where two or more languages can function within one city, within one community, even within one conversation. Um, and it's also a very diverse place. It's one of the fascinating things about Ukraine is how different the linguistic landscape is going from you know, the Carpathians and the borderlands with Hungary, all the way through to, um, to the east, to Donetsk, Luhansk regions. Uh, the, the, the linguistic landscape changes in very, very interesting ways as you travel through the country. Uh, and I want to talk about two very interesting places from that perspective tonight, the places where our speakers come from, so that's Donetsk and Zaporizhia, two places which are names of places which we hear constantly when we we listen to the news about the war, especially in Donetsk, where you know, the war has been affecting Donetsk and the region since 2014. Um, but also more, more recently Zaporizhia, which has been one of the real hotspots of the, since the invasion of last year. 
Um, and I want to ask, first of all, both of our speakers about their, about your experiences of the linguistic landscape of Ukraine, with which you grew up, which you knew, um, the relationship between the Russian language and the Ukrainian language. How was it for you to give our, to give our audience a, an idea of, of what the linguistic situation was in these places? Maybe, uh, Elena, can I start with you? Thank you. Я хочу подякувати всім українцям, які тут, і сказати, що я горда бути частиною нас. І я хочу подякувати всім англійцям, британцям, всім громадянам Великої Британії за підтримку. Без вас ми встояли б, але ціна була б набагато гіршою. Дякую вам, Велика Британія. Я хочу вибачитися за те, що говорю зараз українською, не за те, що говорю українською. Просто вчора я ще говорила англійською, але з помилками. А сьогодні залишились тільки помилки. Я народилась в Донецьку, але я з дитинства знала, що наше місто колись носило зовсім інше ім'я. Воно називалось Юзівка. Це ім'я місто отримало від батька-засновника. Він був уельським інженером, бізнесменом Джоном Хьюзом. Він створив завод і навколо заводу постало місто. Вулиці тут називались номерами. Перша лінія, друга лінія, третя лінія. І навіть тоді, коли ці вулиці вже отримали якісь комуністичні імена, дівчата і хлопці ходили на променад на першу лінію. То у нас був чудовий шанс говорити про більш широкий мовний колорит. Ми б могли зараз обговорювати проблеми не тільки української і російської, але ще й англійської мови і уельської мови які були притаманні цій території, принаймні, наприкінці XIX століття. Приблизно така історія є і у нашого прекрасного міста Луганська, який був заснований шотландцем Чарусом Гаскойном. І там також могло постати англійське мовне середовище. Однак сталося так, як сталося. Голодомором вибило з життя українських селян, і сюди приїхали росіяни-робітники. І моя земля зазнала русифікації. І зрештою я екземпляр цієї русифікації, чесно. Я російськомовна, я народилась в російськомовній родині, я вчилась в російськомовній школі, я вчилась в російськомовному університеті. Але я думала про те, що українською ніби не говорю і ніби не знаю її, аж допоки вона не прийшла до мене на уроках української мови разом зі вчителькою, яка пропонувала нам писати твори на вільну тему. І з'ясували, що українською я пишу краще, ніж російською. Тому що російською я ніби знаю правила, я ніби маю їх притримуватися і бути хорошою, точною в виконанні цих правил. А українською я можу собі дозволити бути собою. І це було відчуття дива, тому що моя вчителька з російської мови дуже ображалась. Чому вона не пише так російською? А вчителька українською говорила, тому що це не мова. І я дуже вдячна їй сьогодні, своїй вчительці, яка подарувала мені можливість писати українською мовою. І вийшло так, що писати українською я почала раніше, ніж говорити. І друга моя історія про дитинство – це історія про няню, чи можна так говорити для радянських людей, це нонсенс мати няню, але у мене була. 
вона була україномовна, вона була прекрасна. Вона навчила мене сваритись українською мовою. Оце прекрасне срака мотика. Це те, що не можна перекласти, я думаю, жодною мовою світу. Я була в захопленні від неї і від мови. І я постійно ходила за нею, перепитуючи, а як оце, а як тут. І вона в серцях відповідала мені, все, не хочу говорити, закрий рот, а жаба тобі зараз цицьку дасть. Це теж не можна перекласти. Але зараз я розумію, що я ображала її. Я розумію, що вона бачила в мені імперіаліста. Що вона бачила в мені отого колоніального диктатора, який ніби сміється над її мовою. Я відчуваю це зараз, але я ніколи не думала так тоді, чесно. Я люблю її, вона померла і буду любити завжди. І я знаю багато-багато сварливих слів. І вони дуже допомагають мені сказати все, що я думаю про Русню. У мене є ще багато історій, але я передам. I could listen to these stories for like hours and I hope that I will have such an opportunity later. Um, my um, linguistic background story is somewhat similar uh, to Olena's because uh, I come from a Russian speaking city uh, which paradoxically used to be the is the heartland of Ukrainian national myth. So Ukrainian uh, national mythology is uh, tightly tied to Zaporizhia uh, because Zaporizhia is this uh, heartland of uh, Ukrainian Cossackdom. Zaporizhia and Cossacks were these proverbial heroes of Ukrainian history, um, the so-called free men, this is how their uh, name translates, of the steppes, uh, who roamed there and who managed to establish a proto-state in the south uh, of what is now uh, Ukraine. Uh, and they had different um, principles of governance, which we can call proto-democratic, and Ukrainians are very proud of this tradition. But it was uh, eradicated, uh, as uh, many things, uh, in our country by Russian imperialism, because in the uh, 18th century, Catherine II uh, just destroyed the Zaporizhian host, and the Zaporizhian Cossacks were no more. Um, and what followed were just centuries of Russification, um, and as Olena, I'm also a fruit, a fruit of that uh, painful process. Uh, my family is a mixture of uh, uh, Russians, ethnic Russians, of Jews and of Ukrainians, who were all um, made into this um, uniform mass of Soviet citizens uh, who spoke Russian. Um, and but I'm, I'm also a, a child of independence, which, uh, which means that uh, I went to school and I had a choice. And uh, the choice of uh, my mother was to send me to a Ukrainian school. So I had this privilege to study in, in the Ukrainian language. For her, it was quite obvious. Uh, we already had Russian. And the more languages a child has, the better. She, she would have better prospects in life. So I studied Ukrainian in school. But uh, although Ukrainian was the language of education, um, I was still in this Russian-speaking environment where uh, the language of culture was considered Russian. Uh, it was the language of literature, it was the language into which all the classics were translated, it was the language of the library of my grandparents. Um, Russian was uh, fashioned into this universal language of cultural values, while Ukrainian was uh, like a quirky local deviation. It's good to have it, but it's not obligatory to be considered a cultured person. Um, all that changed for me um, really late, <laughs> really late in life, in 2013, I think. Uh, when uh, the Euromaidan happened, uh, it was the Ukrainian Revolution of Dignity, when uh, Russian lies and Russian pop propaganda was poured uh, onto us uh, in great quantities to our uh, great disapproval. Uh, and, I was, uh, and we just realized what this language actually meant. It was the weapon our enemy used against us. And this was also when I decided that I had to refuse to be, you know, uh, 
uh, to take this this weapon and use it against myself. So I, I switched. I switched to the Ukrainian language in 2013, 2014, when Russia invaded Ukraine under the pretext of liberating the Russian-speaking uh, population and defending it against the. Uh, nationalist Kievan uh, regime, so they, they were claiming to defend myself, the Russian-speaking population of Ukraine, from myself, the nationalist Kievan regime. Uh, and I switched to the Ukrainian language, and since then my life changed to the better. Um, so, thank you so much. Um, so, that, that was, this brings me on precisely to my next question, which is about this um, tendency which we observe very powerfully over the last year, but not only over the last year, maybe over you know, the last couple of decades, um, for people to switch, people who are Russian speakers, but they decide, they make a conscious decision to, to switch the language in which they speak, um, which is a, perhaps to, to us here in the UK, to English speakers, most of whom only speak one language, can seem like a very, very strange concept that you might so, give up on the language that you were brought up with, that you spoke with your parents. Um, it seems like quite a radical step and a very uh, brave thing to do, and also, but also the way that both the, you, know, you described it in, in the essay that you wrote for New Lines as ripping your mother tongue from your throat, which is a very violent image. You know, it, it feels like a, it feels like a very almost shocking thing to hear. I also, you know, I read uh, an interview which Elena gave to another a journalist, uh, Elena Rosainova, for Lily Bennett, where, you know, you, you spoke about being ashamed of publishing in Russian and, and publishing and uh, writing in Russian in the past. And it, it also, it feels somehow shocking to, to see someone say that they feel ashamed for, for creative, you know, for, for being a creative person, for the, for the literature and for, you know, for writing in the language that comes naturally for them. So I want to ask you about that, about that, you know, how difficult was it? What was it that was the final push that gave you the push that you had to do this? And I mean, does, does it feel shocking to you that you have made this change? It was not difficult. В английском мове є таке такий вираз Um, safe and sound. Um, і англійська мова в цьому сенсі дуже розумна. В українській мові є, в російській мові є таке саме, такий самий вислів цілий і неушкоджений. Um, safe and unharmed. Це база. Тому що українська мова для мене це про safe and sound. Тому що коли ми їхали із Донецька в 2014 році, то я подумала, а як, я, ну як вони почнуть стріляти, так як вони робили в Бучі тепер, а як вони почнуть вбивати, і як я не помру, а тільки втрачу свідомість і потім прийду до тями десь, як я узнаю, що я серед своїх. І тільки мова є відповідь і ключ. Тільки якщо буде саунд, якщо буде українська, то я вдома. Це один із варіантів, я передам тоді і потім ще розкажу. I, I just want to contribute a story which is a follow-up to what Elena has just said. Uh, I went to a couple of uh, tactical, tactical medicine trainings in Kyiv just uh, a couple of weeks ago. And there they teach you uh, how to uh, provide like first, first aid uh, in an emergency situation. So in case you see a serviceman or a service woman who has passed out and you want to check if they are conscious, uh, one of the first rules is that you should not address them in the Russian language. Mm -hmm. You should only use Ukrainian language. Because for them, Russian is coded as the enemy's language. Однак в Україні говорять російською мовою. І тепер говорять російською мовою. Це не злочин. Говорять воїни, говорять волонтери. Українська мова – це не примус, це вибір. 
у мене є guilty pleasure, я люблю детективні серіали англійські. Інспектор Джордж Джентлі подарував мені формулу один з епізодів цього серіалу. Йдеться про події початку 60-х років ХХ століття. 20 років після війни, плюс-мінус. Інспектор просить свого старого друга на прізвисько Чайна допомогти з перекладом з німецької мови. Чайна вивчив німецьку мову, оскільки він не встиг евакуюватись з Дюнкерку. І провів там 5 років. І після того все добре завершується. І інспектор Джентлі питає в Чайни, як тобі було говорити німецькою. І він відповідає йому, говорити нормально, слухати не можна. Я дуже вдячна за цю формулу. Тож говорити в Україні російською плюс-мінус – але слухати неможливо. Maybe another story from from the ground regarding the future of of the linguistic situation in Ukraine. So in Lviv, there is a volunteers hub in the very center of the old city, in what is a children's library. And what they are making there now is masking nets for the army so that the military equipment is covered uh, and not seen by the, by the enemy. And people who are doing these uh, masking nets, uh, making them are mostly women. Uh, some are locals, uh, um, but uh, I happened to just uh, chance upon many women who were displaced from uh, southern and eastern Ukraine, from Mykolaiv, from Odessa, from Zaporizhia, from Dnipro. And uh, you, they were all laboriously speaking Ukrainian, but you could tell that they are like native Russian speakers, but they, they have made the switch. Their children, however, who were running around, were, they all sounded like they were born in Halicina. They, they had this like beautiful, uh, sonorous uh, Ukrainian language of, of Lviv's natives. So, so uh, I'm hopeful that the next generation of Ukrainians will, will speak Ukrainian effortlessly. And this choice is historic and it's been made. Thank you both for the answers. Um, I, wanna, I think we'll probably come back to the question of the Russian language and Ukrainian and Russian and, and the, the questions from the, the audience, I'm sure. But I want to move away from it slightly with my next question, and that's about the Ukrainian language. Um, and about how the Ukrainian language is changing during the war. Because um, we were, I mean, just before this, uh, Irina and I were talking about how, you know, when you go to Ukraine, people speak in the language of weapons and missiles and drones and air defenses and all this terminology and these acronyms, which, you know, 10 years ago was sound like some kind of nonsense. But now, you know, every children understand this language. Um, it's also entered into all kinds of new idioms and colloquialisms and in an often a very humorous way, but all kinds of ways in which the language is changing. So I want to ask you, you know, what have you observed in the way that the Ukrainian language has, has been affected by the world? And I think, Elena, you might have some small short text to read for us about that. Я писала, а переклали в Оксфорді, тому помилки будуть тільки в pronunciation. The first things to disappear on 24th of February um, were words and their meanings, and in general meaning. Everything done, written, analyzed, imagined, and published by me lost its meaning. Everything that was reasonable and useful yesterday ceased to be reasonable and useful. My past life turned out to be empty. The only things that made sense were what you could do with your hands, feet and body, mixing Molotov cocktails, exercising tactical medical skills, 
delivering aid for the elderly and children and blood that you can donate at the blood donor center. And the body which can shield children in the case of shelling. The significance of the body and blood remains just as Germany today. Together with words of the past, words of today, of uh, here and now, have lost their meaning. They stopped working and being able to describe anything. Pain was more than pain. Ferocity more than ferocity. Fear more than fear. The silence was shared. People hardly spoke to each other. The address uh, where you were to uh, administer assistance, the gesture, take my love, I don't need to, or a look and a nod in the line for blood donation. Not words, but comments, short, matters of uh, fact requests, instructions on how to provide first aid for wounds to the back. We just looked at each other. Words were not necessary. Only actions made sense. And full language, obstentious. They explained and expressed everything. Even now this works. We have a rich dictionary of obscene lexis. Multidimensional, clear, short words. Then words appeared. Those uh, that were left acquired new meaning. It was very important not to miss uh, this. What words return, but the feeling of scent, cement uh, in my mouth after writing or after talking remains unchanged. Pain is still more than pain. Therefore, only those who know how to handle words properly, properly are engaged in the uh, retrieval. Uh, and um, I have my translation of, uh, uh, I'm sorry for this, um, for, from Pavlo Korobchuk, a Ukrainian poet and writer. Uh, and uh, he was precisely about uh, words. The alphabet uh, has not yet been uh, invented. Words have not yet been spoken. Letters have not yet been drawn. Trees are not yet flames. Voices are not yet meanings. Voices are not yet a book. Я вважаю, що він сказав краще. That was beautiful. Um, maybe just um, to add that there are, in addition to what uh, William has mentioned, uh, that the language is very much militarized against our will. There are some neologisms apart from swear words um, that describe this new reality. Reality, for example, like Russism. Uh, Russism appeared this year, and it is a word which combines fascism, obviously, and it specifies where the fascism comes from, from Russia. It's Russian fascism. It's very specific to the Russian world and the ideology. Or, or uh, some of the Ukrainian uh, words have acquired new meanings. For example, polonitsa. Uh, Polonitsa is a Ukrainian word for loaf of bread, so it's a sign of hospitality. But it's become a shibboleth word uh, since the full-scale invasion, uh, because uh, some, some mixture of uh, consonants and vowels makes it unpronounceable for, for native Russian speakers. Russophone Ukrainians can say Polonitsa perfectly well. Russians can't, and uh, so this uh, this is how friends were distinguished from foes uh, in in their early weeks and months of the full-scale invasion, where every, everyone was afraid of spies for, for good reason. Thank you so much, Sasha. And this question of obscenities as well is something that I noticed in the first days and weeks of the war. One, one thing that I was doing, I was asking writers that I know to send me texts, which I would translate and trying to get published in, in English. And this, this idea kept coming up. They said our only response was this, we didn't know how to, to speak, we didn't know what to say to each other, but we were swearing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we jumped out of bed and we were swearing. And that was, it was remarkable how many of the people I wrote to wrote to me about this. And this was the only kind of outlet for, for emotions, I guess. 
Um, I'm sure there will be lots and lots of questions. I think I will already um, move to the floor uh, for your questions. So please just put your hand up and we'll send you a microphone. Um, and if you don't mind, introduce yourself before you um, ask the question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tatiana Nesichuk, I'm Ukrainian living in London. And my question is to Elena about her book, The um, Death of the Cecil. Um, but I'm sorry to the English speakers here, which has not yet been published in English. But that book is actually written in two languages, Russian and Ukrainian. And it has sort of split a lot of the Ukrainians that I know, with some saying this is fantastic because it is just like our country and others, um, you know, saying, oh no, you should all be Ukrainian. I'd like to find out from you what was the choice, uh, what was the reason behind the choice of two languages? Thank you. Книжка насправді написана двома мовами. І головна ідея тут – це перехід. І моя ідея була в тому, щоб читач український не помітив, як він перейшов. Щоб читаючи спочатку російською, він потрапив в українську спокійно. І навіть не помітив, що він вже читає, говорить і любить Україну українську. My question is not about swearing, but just to, uh, uh, I just wanted to say that apparently swearing is a pain killer uh, when we uh, say some words uh, out loud to ourselves, uh, we get an endorphin rush. So it doesn't surprise me at all that you bring us swearing. Um, and um, my question is actually about uh, bilingualism and code switching in culture and in literature, so it follows on from the previous question really well. And, and it's a question for both of you, and maybe also for William, because it's about translation. And I'm wondering, so far, how has bilingualism, the particular bilingualism of Ukraine, and the code switching that takes place in Ukraine, how has that figured in literature and film as well? And how has it been translated? And is that changing? Or can you imagine that changing? <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for this question. Uh, it's funny that usually the first example that I give when I um, respond to, to something along these lines is uh, Olena's book, uh, which she has just discussed. So this is a perfect uh, example of code switching in, in between Russian and Ukrainian. Um, other examples, um, I'm, I'm thinking now about um, Natalka Vrozhbit's uh, uh, script for the film Cybergs, which discusses the defense of the Donetsk airport, uh, where uh, we also have this mixture of uh, Ukrainian and Russian speakers from, from all over the country, and uh, their political views do not always align with their linguistic identity, um, and that characterizes the country and the, make, the linguistic and the political makeup of the country for, for a certain period of time. I think it will change now. Um, and we will encounter a different coding of the Russian language in Ukraine. I don't know. I know what I can do. I did it. But I am confident that it is not difficult.